that picture, what do you see? You see a woman smiling with a little boy smiling. You know, when we see pictures like this, you see these smiles, it's a snapshot. It's a moment. Everything looks great, right? That's me and my son, Brian. I see that smile there, but I also know things about what was happening at that time that you don't know. I know that I was doing the best I could as a mom. I worked really hard. And I also reflect now when I look at that picture about 10 years from that time, Brian would develop an addiction. And it got really hard and scary. And I had to learn how to live my life knowing that he might die from his addiction. Hello, my name is Karen and I'm a mom. Mom, that word elicits many emotions from people. You may have felt something, thought something when you heard me say that. In my role, I'm a mental health counselor. I hear lots of people talk about their experiences as a mom and with their moms. I am a mom and I have a mom. So there's lots of things that can come up around the word and that role. There are really high expectations for moms in the outcomes with their children, in, with their children. But when Brian was going through his addiction, what I found was that those expectations and the responsibility was even more intense for the outcomes for our children. So there are three things that I learned along my journey that I want to share with you today. Moms are powerful, but we can't help others until we help ourselves. The words, I can't do this anymore, were words that I said many times throughout the course of Brian's active addiction. But what I came to find was that I could do more. I just had to figure out what those things were. And today I wanna to illustrate to you how powerful moms are and the importance of being the healthiest you can be and keep finding the things that you can do. During the course of the year of April 2016 and June 2017, I found myself on the roller coaster of addiction with Brian, trying to figure out how to m live my life. I'm going to come back to that section in just a minute, but that year was very important. According to the CDC, in 2019, there were 70,630 drug overdose deaths in that year alone. That means that there were 70,630 moms that lost their children that year. Brian entered 40 plus detox and treatment centers between 2011 and 2017. What that means is he would enter a detox unit for a period of time and leave, enter a treatment center and leave, maybe enter a hospital and leave. He completed a couple of 30-day programs, but over those years, it was in and out, in and out. So it was in, and I was, he's in, he's going to do something different, excited, and then he'd leave. So over and over, that's what happened. There are many events that illustrate this roller coaster, but there was one that kind of started in 2016. In April, Brian went to jail. And I felt this defeated feeling that uh, another thing that we were going through. However, when he was there, I noticed that he sounded better. And that made me kind of happy. I knew where he was for that period of time. I knew he had food, a roof over his head. And that felt pretty good. And he kept sounding stronger and stronger. So that made me happy, of course. When he got out of jail, it was maybe 12 hours before he used, and I could feel the tension building that we were starting that roller coaster again. And I had to do something. The roller coaster was too much. And furthermore, people didn't believe me or understand what was happening. I thought he was doing so good, they would say. So I started to write. I got this idea that I would just write every day for a year and I decided to write on one side of a page what was happening for me, what I was thinking and feeling and doing, and the other side of the page I would write what was happening for him, 
whatever I knew. And I decided I would do that no matter what happened over that year, which there were times when I had to envision, well, if he dies now, what am I gonna write about? But that's what I decided to do, because I just had to do something. It was during that year that as I wrote every day what I was doing, going to work, and the emotions that were, were coming up, I realized that my world was getting really small, talking about the treatment centers, trying to figure out where he was, what he was doing, how he was doing. And we were on a family outing one day, and one of the family members said, can we not talk about Brian today? And I was kind of irritated about that. Why? Well, you know, I was irritated. But then I had to really think about it. There were other people in my life besides him, other family members who needed me or wanted some attention from me, of course. On the night of February 3rd into the 4th of 2017, um, I was sleeping. I didn't leave my ringer on on my phone, but I did look at it throughout the night. That was my way of kind of staying connected with what was going on out there. And on that particular night, I saw, I picked up the phone in the middle of the night and saw a bunch of missed calls and texts. And when I got up to find out what was happening with my heart racing, I found out that Brian had overdosed. They found him in a parking lot, in a motel, a motel parking lot, and they were working on him and they weren't sure if he was gonna make it. Brian did make it that night. He didn't stop using drugs that night, and he almost died. Around the same time, I took a job that was a really good professional opportunity for me, um, and I was really excited about it. But it was also around that same time that I found myself crying all the time. I would wake up in the morning and literally tears would just start coming out of my eyes. I would be driving and just start crying or in a conversation with someone, mid-sentence, get choked up and have to stop. And it was at that job that that kept happening and one day I couldn't even get to work. I quit that job, I couldn't do it. And that was very difficult. I had to leave clients, I wasn't you know, progressing in my career, so now my family's been affected, my job's been affected, and I found things getting really difficult. All these people who were counting on me for certain things. Someone talked about that crying thing as anticipatory grief. It's a grief where you're grieving someone who's not yet gone. And this brings me to point number two. Find your way of healing. I spent a lot of time in Al-Anon over the years, and there were a lot of terms that were used that I learned there. Enabling, tough love, rock bottom, hope. A lot of suggestions and advice were given. Let him stay, kick him out, shut off his phone, make a lot of rules, set boundaries, be really strict, all kinds of stuff. It was very confusing, and I kept trying all these things to figure it out. There was an occasion where Brian was in treatment near us in the Northeast. He was in Florida at the time. And he flew up from Florida, and I asked the treatment center if I could bring him some clothes. It was near the holidays, and it was colder there. And they said, sure, you can bring some clothes. So on the drive down, Brian called and said, hey, can I come home with you? I just want to be near family for the holidays. My husband and I discussed it on the remainder of the trip, and we decided we would take him home. However, when we got there, the staff kind of started talking to us, telling us that they've seen this before. They're gonna sit with Brian. They'll, they'll help him settle in. They know, how to, they know how to handle this. They convinced us, it seemed like more and more people showed up and they convinced us to leave him. I didn't get to see him that day. That was after his overdose, so I had to just leave. I decided to leave. They must know more than me. This is their job. They know how to handle this. That's what they told me. I cried most of the way home, but it really left me questioning, what do I know about my family? <laughs> what do I know about this situation? I didn't like that feeling. In our country, the go-to support groups are 12-step programs. Spent a lot of time there, and I gained a lot of information and support there. But I wanna say today that there are lots of ways of healing, and I began finding other ways, 
that might be helpful for me. And my husband and I started attending fairs that um, incorporated Reiki and psychic mediums and tarot card readers and craniosacral, all kinds of stuff. And at one of these fairs, a woman suggested to me to envision Brian encircled in a green bubble of light. Green is the color of Archangel Raphael, and Archangel Raphael is the Archangel of Healing. So one morning I was walking by a field near our house, and the sun was coming through the trees. And I looked over and I thought, I'm gonna try that. And so I envisioned it, this green bubble. I just envisioned it kind of like the Wizard of Oz, this bubble just floating up over the field. And I felt this shift inside of me. I thought, that feels better, having someone, something else there that, that could help. I felt some relief for a moment, and I, it felt good. There are many ways people heal and recover and find relief. They attend smart recovery meetings or craft meetings. There's a mindfulness practice that people have that can help them settle in their emotions and their feelings. People attend church and counseling. I, I like counseling, which brings me to point number three. It's a we thing. This is my final point that I want to make, how important it is to stay involved as best you can. It's in September 2017, I flew down to Florida and drove Brian up to the Northeast where we lived. It took a lot of confidence for us to both make that decision to do that big move. He wanted to change, he said. He wanted to be around family. And it was in the early weeks that he was home that he was supposed to be home one night at a certain time, and I woke up and he wasn't there. I got up and I called him, and I heard this sound in his voice of desperation and kind of sadness. And I said, what are you doing? He said, Mom, I messed up, I used. I'm driving back to Massachusetts. And in that moment, hearing that sound in his voice, I said, Brian, just come home. We're gonna figure this out. I said that from my heart that surprised me. I'd kicked him out before for using. It's not the way we wanted to live. But I felt it. I heard his desperation and I wanted him home and I wanted to work through this. He did come back and we kept on. There was another time he ended up in the emergency room with another drug-related event. My husband and I sat with him and he was agitated. He wanted to leave, he's used to doing that. Just wanna go have a cigarette, he wanted to leave. And my husband spoke up, who doesn't usually speak up. He usually kind of let me do that talking, but that night he said, Brian, sit down. We're all tired. We're all in this together. We're gonna wait for the doctor, and then we're gonna figure this out. And he did, and we did. Family members are affected by those with addictions. It takes courage for all of us to take steps towards healing and recovery. It's so important, and there are favorable outcomes. It's possible with all of us working together. I don't advocate for families to be in harm's way, to be verbally or physically abused, or have their property stolen, because I know those things happen, so that's another thing. But there are some things I learned, this enabling word that I heard in Al-Anon. It felt really judgy. My takeaway after all of this time was that I had to make decisions that were best for me and my family. I had to understand why I was doing what I was doing and really explore that. What was my motivation for what I did for me? Tough love, we, we tried that. I believe more love is necessary and it doesn't have to be tough, but love that's compassionate and not over-responsible. Rock bottom, I th that, that motel parking lot was pretty bottom. I didn't want to find out what else there was, so we kind of let that one go. And hope is hope. That was part of the roller coaster. I still like that word and that concept, but I chose to, to have a view of the future that was something that was healthier, that was more settled. And I wanted that, and I wanted to work toward that but I let go of some particular outcome because I didn't know if he was gonna live. So I wanted to keep working towards something better. Next month, month, Brian will be four years heroin free. Recovery and the struggle for healing continues for both of us. 
Maybe you know someone who's going through this, and maybe you are. I encourage you to fight to heal and grab onto any information you can. I had to take care of myself, and you can too. I had to find my way to heal and live, and you can too. I'm not fully responsible, it's a we thing. There's power in working together, and you can too. We all have qualities of confidence, compassion, and courage inside of us. Access those, and there's nothing you can't do. May we all have peace and healing. Thank you.